Welcome to First Reading, the Old Testament lectionary podcast for preachers, teachers, and all of God's creatures. I'm Rachel Wren. And I'm Tim McNinch. This week, we're bringing you preaching tips on Exodus 17, 1 through 7, which is the Exodus version of one of those grumbling in the wilderness stories. This is the first reading scheduled in the lectionary for September 27th, 2020. And here to walk with us through the text is a special guest exegete. That's right. With us today is Reverend Dr. Valerie Bridgman. Dr. Valerie is a perfect fit for this podcast because she is not only an associate professor of homiletics and Hebrew Bible at Methodist Theological School in Ohio, she is also the Dean and Vice President for Academic Affairs at that same school, and she is ordained. Her research interests range from womanist approaches to prophetic biblical literature to African-American women preachers to embodied ritual remembrance. So basically, I'm just going to be sitting here at her feet for as long as she allows me soaking up wisdom. <laughs> if you are also interested in more of her work, we'd recommend you check out her stuff on Working Preachers website. Dr. Valerie Bridgman, welcome to First Reading. Thank you. Well, Dr. Valerie, thanks so much for being with us. Um, You know, we might not all still be on lockdown by the time this goes to air, but uh, the pandemic is certainly a big deal for all of us. So um, what's been getting you through the pandemic? Do you have any new hobbies or baking or writing or family stuff that you're doing? Yeah, I don't I don't have any new hobbies. But what's been getting (laughs) me through the pandemic, honestly, is Central Ohio has a lot of metro parks. Uh, walking trails. And uh, Mm -hmm. so I decided that I would walk all 20 plus of the preservation and and metro parks in the area, in my general area. And so I'm now within four parks of having all of those done. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, you'll probably have to finish that cycle of parks and start over again. At least it's something I can do that's healthy and it's mental health as well, right? You, I can get out and clear my brain and pray while I'm walking or, you know, all those things. Or listen to good podcasts, actually, which I often mm-hmm. do. Absolutely. We're all for that. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so um, I want to ask you a little bit about your current position, which is both homiletics and Hebrew Bible. Mm-hmm. Um What's your story a little bit of, on how they came to be so intertwined for you? Well, my dad was a, was a preacher, and he preached out of the Old Testament a lot. So I always knew I was going to keep the ethic of interpretation and the ethics of preaching, because ethics was my cognate at Baylor, uh, in conversation with each other. Um, I didn't know I was going to teach preaching, but when I got out of seminary, that was the first call I got at Memphis to teach, Mm -hmm. to come teach preaching. And I said, I won't do it if I can't also teach Hebrew Bible, partly because what was happening to a lot of African-American scholars who were working in Bible, whether New Testament or Old Testament, is the only kind of calls they were getting from seminaries were to come teach preaching. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so, okay, I can teach preaching, but I can't teach the discipline that I'm trained in. No, Mm -hmm. I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. bless you for pushing back against that. (laughs) Well, it's such a such a joy to have you with us. We would like to start out by reading the passage, the lectionary text, which is Exodus 17, 1 through 7. Dr. Valerie, would you read that for us in English? Sure. This is uh, Exodus 17 and 7 from the New Revised Standard Version. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Raphidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock. 
and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? So ends the reading. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Now this is an interesting story um, for anybody who's interested in the the Torah, the Pentateuch, those first five books of the Bible, because it's a doublet. There's it shows up in a different place with a slightly different um, kind of tone to it. Um, in in Numbers twenty, where it shows up, Moses is rebuked actually for striking the rock. It's not what he's supposed to do. Right. Uh, but this this passage makes no comment on that detail. There's no judgment of Moses at all here. So, what do you make of kind of the the whole of the overall point of this text when it's in relief with this other Numbers text? In, in this text, God tells Moses to strike the rock. So yeah. in in the other text, he actually is told to strike the rock too. He's rebuked for striking it twice. Ah, right. okay, right, it's like right. A little petty, but <laughs> it's interesting to know what what is the story actually about, right? Mm-hmm. Is it about God's provision? Is it about Moses' faithfulness? Is it about the people's fear and therefore faithlessness, or is it? D all of the above, which I'm hmm. probably inclined to say D all of the above. I, I find it interesting in this text that they repeat, but the people were thirsty, yeah. right? It's just like the people yeah. were thirsty. They ask Moses a question. He was like, what? Why are you asking me this? And then they say, but the people were thirsty as in uh, Moses. How about you answer the question? Interesting. So it's a little bit of a pushback against Moses there, too. Or it's an acknowledgement that the people's needs are real. Yeah, that's right. And the and the idea of thirst here isn't, you know, that they were a little peaked. You know, they they were <laughs> in a dangerous place. In the, if you've ever spent any time out in the wilderness where there's no water to be had, if if you get stuck, that's a life threatening situation. Absolutely. So this wasn't just sort of minor complaining about inconvenience. This this was a real need. But the people were thirsty. Mm-hmm. That's right. Now we like to do uh, language stuff with our listeners a little bit to help preachers for whom their Hebrew might be a bit rusty to kind of think through some of the Hebrew things going on here. So the the people quarreled with Moses in verse two or argued with Moses, and that's this Hebrew word riv. Can you uh, can you flesh that word out for us a little bit because it's an interesting word in in Hebrew. I mean, it is um, the notion of sort of combative language, right? So mm. it's not it it isn't just I disagree with you. It really yeah. is what the whole. <laughs> right. Where is our water? What in yeah. the world? Yeah. Uh-huh. What, yeah. Isn't, isn't it a this... word that's often used in warfare texts, like about battles and that kind of? Like, yeah. It's... I mean, so is Moses really a great leader? Like you got us out here in the middle of nowhere with not a plan for feeding us or giving us anything to drink. What? about that makes you a good leader. It, it's so you're so right and what's so funny is that Moses doesn't really own that. He kind of says, "Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you nasa? Why do you try God?" Like all of a sudden Moses kind of takes it up a notch. Moses, he has this notion. I mean, God did tell him in the beginning, you know, that he would be like God to Aaron mm. and he would be like God to Pharaoh. So if mm-hmm. Moses has a God complex, God gave it to him. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, it's like yeah. my word, Moses's word is supposed to be taken as the very word of God. So when Moses connects these two things, he's in a tradition that has started mm. in the biblical text, out at least in the text out of the mouth of the deity, right? You will be like God to the people. So when they when he says here, why are you why are you trying me? Why are you trying God? It is to try me is to try God. And the challenge around this is that in some very hierarchical churches, people feel like that way about the pastor. If you challenge the pastor, you're challenging God. Mm -hmm. Uh, Again, 
pit, pitfalls being what they are in a, in the Hebrew biblical tradition, that's true. And we have to be careful not to presume this kind of I and I alone can hear from God. I alone mm-hmm. can fix it, right, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, I, 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 I love this. And I think I have a kind of like a preaching instinct right now, and I want to try it out on you, because I think that he doesn't know what to do with these people. And the two things that God sort of teaches him in that moment is take with you some of the elders, right? You're not going to do this alone, and provide for the people. You know, right. like this is almost, there almost seems to be a, a teaching moment for Moses here as a leader of the people. Does that seem accurate to you? I would, I would amen that if I heard it from a pulpit, mm. you're not going to do this alone, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, but that inclination is there, right? You know, to take on all of that for yourself, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, Moses is going to hear that again from his father-in-law, the Mid- Midianite priest. Why are you trying mm-hmm. to do all this by yourself? That leaning toward a uh, lone wolfsmanship or whatever is kind of imprinted on this text. If you believe God has said something to you, and if anybody pushes back on that, then what? You know, how how yeah. do how does that become a conversation as opposed to a rebellion? Now, one of the things that really jumps out at me about that interaction is that even though Moses does have that sense that he's supposed to represent God to the people, when Moses interacts with God, it's his humanity that really seems to jump out at me. He's scared. He's he's totally fearful of being killed. The people are about to stone me. What do I do? He's he's sort of in a panicky mode, whereas God responds with this sort of calm assertiveness it just seems so much in in contrast to the crisis mode that Moses is in. Let me say this about Moses as his part. So Moses represents God to the people, but he also represents the people to God. So he's an intercessor, right? I don't know that it's just Moses' fear that he's representing to God. Mm. He's yeah. representing as an intercessor the fear the people feel because the people are thirsty. I repeat, yeah. right? Yeah. Mean, so like, yeah. so so that representing of the people is, yes, probably Moses' fear about being stoned because, you know, if you've ever been hangry, you know how <laughs> you get, you know? So t- what I'm trying to say in that, I don't think those two things are in opposition to one another, uh-huh. that both, uh-huh. both of those things is true. Now, as to the deity in this case being calm, yeah, I mean, it, it is one of those places where God doesn't threaten to annihilate the people off the face of the <laughs> earth. Thanks, thanks be to God, right? <laughs> so, so maybe this is one of those places where even the editors looking at these ancient texts recognize human need needs to be addressed, right? Mm. And so they put that in the deity's mouth, in the deity's, I'm not saying God didn't say that, in, the, but I'm talking mm-hmm. about textually, the way it comes across. Mm-hmm. Y- you're not going to do this by yourself. Grab you some elders. Come on, let's go. <laughs> You've mm-hmm. seen this before. You have what's in your hand. Take that staff. Yeah. You know, take the staff, the thing that's in your hand and go forward with that. So, you know, you're not without resources. You've Mm -hmm. seen this before. You've seen need before and you've seen me provide. So Mm -hmm. the whole thing about testing God here, uh, it's like, but you've seen me deliver. Why? Why are you still saying I want to go back to Egypt? Why are you still wondering whether I brought you out here to die? You've seen me deliver. Why is that a thing? You know, why mm-hmm. Why is that your fallback, right? Yeah. Uh, fear makes us fall back to things that we think are familiar, even if they are dangerous to us, even mm-hmm. if they were not life-giving, right? We, we mm-hmm. want to go back to something that's familiar. So... The deity says, you've seen this before. Take your staff, the one that you parted the reed sea with, the one that they saw you part the reed sea with. This is the same generation of people. This is not Uh a new group of people. 
Same right. people. Well, you know, this is, it's interesting. We don't often draw the New Testament into what we're doing in this podcast because we were trying to emphasize the first reading. <laughs> uh, but I can't help in our conversation here thinking of the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 where the disciples come to him in a panic saying, we don't have any food. You know, the people are hungry. They're going to starve. Let You know, send them back where they came from. And, and Jesus very much takes on the, the role of God in this story saying, well, you should feed them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't, well, what do you have? Yeah. Use that. Yeah. And so th- it's an interesting parallel. Yeah. 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 You're right. I wouldn't normally do that at all. I, in fact, I would, <laughs> I would have taken 10 points off on any student who did that in my class. I, and I get your point. I mean, it, it, particularly as we talk about preaching this particular text, it's like it is when we feel desperate, we may we may feel desperate and not be as desperate as we feel. Mm-hmm. Re- resources mm-hmm. may be as close as what's in your hand. What's in your hand. Yeah. And who's with yeah. you. And I, I really like the way that this story shows that in that moment of need, God responds by saying, what, what should you do? You should listen to what they're asking for and help them. Mr. Leader, if you want to learn leadership here, mm-hmm. listen to the people, help them with what they need help with, and use the resources that I've given you for that. Too, because but. the people are actually thirsty. I mean, I, thirsty. I just, yep. I keep going back to that. It's like, it's not, oh, the people thought they were thirsty. or the people yeah. felt like they were going to get thirsty. It's, well, the people were thirsty. Then they say something to Moses, and then he says something back to them. And verse 3 says, but the people were thirsty. Like, dude, mm-hmm. that didn't answer the question about thirst. So mm-hmm. get to get to your point that that leadership is the feel, is not just a felt need, it's the real need. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times yeah. people will say, well, what's the felt need of the people? No, 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 no. What's the real the need? The real need. Of the people. Amen. (laughs) I mean, this is this is a bit of a jump to our own context, but I can't help but think about this story in light of the protests that are happening around our nation right now. And the response of leadership often to these protests is so focused on crowd control versus Mm -hmm. like, why not actually listen? to what the Mm. people are saying and discern the real needs and address them. That's how you respond effectively as a leader to this kind of complaint and protest and quarreling is to listen and provide. Because the people are thirsty. thirsty. (laughs) The people are thirsty. I think I'm I'm coming up with a sermon already. I think we're, (laughs) we're starting to see where this is going here. Yeah, I mean, I I agree with you. Tim, I think that's a good point. Again, what you said, crowd control, the the attending to the thing that is not being asked looks like you're attending. You know, why are you testing God? How is that your response to the question? Yeah. Like, why are you testing my authority? Why are you, you know, whatever. How is that your response to the actual need of the people? You know, stop killing us. Start with that. How about that? Yeah. Stop killing yeah. us. Yeah. Uh, and stop sanctioning those killings and stop, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how do you, this is this is kind of where this story gets confusing for me because I, I feel like I'm, I'm running with that idea until I get to verse seven. And the sort of like summative point of the story is that the places were named after the quarreling. Instead of after the provision or the thirst or the what do you what do you do with that? Mm-hmm. It's like how did how did this place get its name? Well, I'll tell you a story, right? So, yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, so it's place naming, but it's also that I do think it's that heavy hand of the editor that it, see from the very beginning the people were this way, even before the people became a nation state. The people were this way, right? It's that kind of of um, of uh, labeling of the people a certain way, and which is interesting for a preaching uh, point is is that right. uh, th- that we name things and we name situations and a group of people a certain way, and we don't seem to be able to get back to but was that really true? Was that the real yeah. issue? Right. Mm. 
so the text says they murmured. Where's where is God in all of this? And um it made me think about uh there was a series, Underground Railroad was the name of the series. And mm. in one in one of the episodes there was a scene where the slave preacher, the man who's enslaved and a preacher, the one that the that the enslaver will allow to preach the gospel to the people. They're out mm-hmm. in the in the hush harbor and he says, he says, don't be discouraged. God is on our side. And Noah, who is one of the characters who ends up running away from the plantation their own, he says, if God has chosen the side, it ain't ours, which is very mm-hmm. powerful, mm-hmm. right? Because in the Underground Railroad, of course, uh, Harriet Tubman becomes known as Moses. You know, it's it, mm. so it's all this allusion to these kinds of stories. If God is with us, where is God? Is God among us or not? If God has chosen a side, is it ours? And that theme of is God with us is also running through the Hebrew Bible, right? Mm-hmm. You know, if mm-hmm. if God is with us, why is all this happening to us? Gideon will late, later say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's certainly the theme in Job. It, where mm-hmm. where are you? You know, so this mm-hmm. contending yeah. with God is is a way to quote bring God down, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, that God would rend the heavens and come down. Isaiah yeah. sixty four yeah. would say. Yeah, and and it makes this text really connect with our our own world and in the middle of this pandemic uh so many people including me keep asking where the heck is god in all of this is god really among us or not like that's that's the kind of question that we um it's not just an ancient question it's a very modern present question for us it is helpful to know that it's an ancient question right because mm, it yeah. says to us that humans have struggled with god's a uh, hide and seek or, or peekaboo relationship with humanity for centuries. This is not new to us. What, what do you do when God is behind some veil or deep darkness or cloud or, you know, and we can't see the hand of God? You know, how do we know that God is with us? You know? Yeah, that, that draws my attention to verse six. Where God's response, you know, giving these instructions to Moses, and God says, "Hineni omed lefanech Hasham," that like, and I'm kind of a fan of the particle "hine." Like, I just like it. I, I I'm trying to incorporate it into my English. Yeah, yeah. Like, just walk around. Hine. You just walk around. <laughs> Behold, hine. <laughs> Every time I enter a room. <laughs> but I like it because that's that's sort of a question to is God among us or not? It's Nay, like if you just look, open your eyes, pay attention. Mm. There's that that participle. I'm standing there, right, in your presence. There. Yeah. If you just it, if you open your eyes to see, nay, ani omed, ani omed lefanecha. I'm standing there, right there with you. Well, yeah. lefanecha is literally in front of your face. In That's front right. of your face, That's right? Yeah. In which, front which, of your face. by by the way. Speaking of God being before you in front of your face, right? That whole thing of we can miss God because mm. we're always we don't know what's a God thing all the time, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we because we we want God to show up in a certain way, mm-hmm. and so we can miss right in front of our face what is the God thing. In response to the the quarreling, to the questioning, to the grumbling, God almost says three things. God says, take people with you, take what's in your hand, and I'm right in front of your face. And with those three things together, we got this. You know, that's kind of like this. <laughs> now all you this. need is a happy poem. Three points and a yeah. happy poem. <laughs> <laughs> Sermon done. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but how do I? I I don't ever want to lose sight of the people's needs and and mm -hmm. trivialize them, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So there's no trivializing of the people's need here, and that's Mm -hmm. what is important. Now that Mm -hmm. Moses misnames it as, uh, "Oh, you just testing God," you know, because 
what? Because you don't because you don't remember what's in your own hand because you can't strategize because what? Right. Moses. Yeah. I I don't also want to be too hard on Moses because he is, in fact, he, Aaron and all of these leaders out here in the middle of nowhere with a group of people. I mean, Uh and really not much more of a plan than go where I send you. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Not exactly what we would call a a strategic plan. Right. (laughs) Oh, but yeah. Well, and it, it kind of reminds me. I I like that you bring up that point that the the people's needs are never trivialized because I don't know if this is fully uh true to the text, but you could almost take that last verse and and sort of say that naming it as the place of quarreling also in some way memorializes the fact that the people spoke out to God out of their real need and God responded with provision for their real need too. Yeah, that's a good way. That, I think that's a good wrap up to that. Mm-hmm. You know, of not trivializing their grumbling and their complaining. But part, partly because we have um we have made pejorative grumbling and complaining. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Now, Tim, to your point about in the cur- current situation, we we have the right to redress our government. We have the right of protest, and that has now been made. Uh, to be uh, an offense to the government right. that gave us the right to redress our concerns and our complaints. So that naming a place protest or, you know, quarreling or whatever it might be is is claiming that and naming that we have that right and ability right. to do that. Right. Yeah. And if you were if you were to read this in the larger biblical context, certainly Psalms has a lot of lamenting in it you know why why are you so far from me god you know why are you hiding your face why you know the whole that's right mm-hmm. why do why do you look on evil yeah why you know so this the right to complain and to murmur is encoded in the biblical text as a human right before the god who says that god loves them mm-hmm. and is with them the biblical text acknowledges you can't claim to be a God who takes care of me and love me and then not take care of me and love me. Yes. Yes. Not, <laughs> exactly. not, not without me complaining about that. Right. <laughs> exactly. That's right. Exactly. Well, we've, we've talked a lot about kind of some of the ways that this text meets us in our modern world and some of how we might preach it, but maybe we should spend a few minutes in our, to wrap up our conversation here really honing in on some sort of a homiletical side of using a text like this. Well, with regard to avoid, I, I think I've already said this, but I do want to say to avoid blaming or shaming the people yeah. for their very real need, right? Because mm-hmm. it's easy. It would be easy to do that and then to therefore do it in our modern context or our current context with other people's very real needs Mm -hmm. in the name Mm -hmm. of saving God. Cause that's usually the reason people do that to the people. They need to save God's reputation. Right. Yeah. I could imagine a sermon saying, you know, quit your grumbling, (laughs) quit complaining. That's the point of this text. And that might not be a helpful direction to take a sermon. Right. And I, I would actually say the point of this text is grumble, complain. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Get yeah. it in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I re- that really resonates with me, too. I think this this concept of real need and how God responds to real need of people and then how we are called to respond to real needs of people. Um, you could take that in lots of different situations and lots of different ways. And I think it's really important in this text. I was just going to say, I often think about not just this, the sermon moment in a, in a service of worship, but kind of how a text like this could fit into the whole sort of, I don't know, liturgical flow of what happens in a church service. This seems to me to be a text where not only as a preacher would you want to say, here's some stuff to think about, now go home and think about it, but maybe this is a text where it's like, okay, now that we've thought through this together... What's what's on our minds? What are our complaints? What do we want to say to God? What's going on in our world and in our community right now? 
and let's take that to God. This I feel like this is a text that could drive right into a, a type of prayer of lament and petition that and is, intercession. Yeah, yes. I think that, I think yeah. that's true. I would agree yeah. with that. Mm-hmm. That'd be a fabulous way. That'd be a, especially if you typically end your sermon with kind of like the thanks be to God or glory be to God, amen moment. Instead, to transition to you know the prayers of intercession directly from your sermon, or um, you know, there, there's different ways you could really do have some interesting liturgical creative moments with this idea. Where can we find our voice in the voice of this people? There, there are <laughs> spiritual ancestors. So, so how can we amplify their voice in our own in our own moment in our own context? Yep, because yep. the people are thirsty. The people are because thirsty. Because the people are thirsty. I think we have a oh. sermon title. We right got a there. sermon title. <laughs> we got a, you can put it on your bulletin board outside the church building. <laughs> Run with it. <laughs> but you know, I I heard something. I was listening to a podcast. It was Michelle Obama's podcast with Michelle Norris, the one that mm. where she talked about. Depression, that's the piece that people Uh focused on. But in the podcast, she made this comment about how all the people are afraid and how all the people are scared. And she said this. She said, I don't think the people uh, that are mislabeling and talking wrongly about Black Lives Matter are, are right about that. She said, I think they're scared and we need to address the fear mm. on all for all the people. Like, well, how mm. do you address the fear for all the people, so that yeah. we're not just talking past each other? We're not just striving against one another. We're not just fighting. We actually are creating space for change for everybody. How does that mm. happen? It's like, how do you change the lens, the shift, so that you can have a conversation that's not based in your fear? or your thirst, but it's based somewhere in God's provision, literally based in what's possible, as opposed to this feeling of scarcity that seems to be rampant, right? Not Mm -hmm. just in the USA, but literally around the world. If we believe the earth belongs to God and everything in it, and that provision comes from everything that's in it, then this fear that there's no water when there's a rock right there that you can strike and water will gush from is is not based in reality it's based in something else based in trauma i mean the people are traumatized they're out in the middle of nowhere without a plan by the way i want to mm. say one more time mm-hmm. and mm. so they're traumatized so how do how do we have trauma informed ministry trauma informed preaching that kind of gets underneath the fear so that the needs the people are trying to express, get expressed. Yeah. I don't know if we can get any better than that. That sounds a perfect place to end right there. What do you think, Tim? Yeah. Well, Dr. Valerie, this has been such a fun and insightful conversation. We yeah. appreciate so much you being with us. Thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thank you. I'm glad to have been able to participate and share in this tradition of digging in text for preaching. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's such a beautiful one, especially when we have people like you to lead us through it. So thanks. Remember, friends, you can catch more of our past episodes on our website, firstreadingpodcast.com. You can also interact with us on our Facebook page. So look us up there. Uh, if you have any friends who haven't heard about us yet, what a shame. Spread the word. Tell just one of them. Until next time, I'm Rachel Wren. And I'm Tim McNinch. Thanks to Blue Dot Sessions for some extra music this week. And thanks to you all for listening. Have a great week.